Guys, I, I'm looking at the, the, the talent you have in this room, I'm sure that they will do you do do your efforts and time justice. And they're some of our best and brightest. And boys, if I could just uh, say how lucky you are to have the opportunity to work with some of our local businesses. The school's strategic planning in the future is uh, looks at obviously enhancing the education of our boys here. And one of the major focuses we have over the next four years is looking at how we can provide real world learning for the students, something they can't get from just within the classroom. Uh, we're looking at how we can bring our community into the school, experts in the school, to enhance the learning of the boys. And I, when, when Andrew McGuire, Greg, came into my office and started talking about an opportunity to work with local enterprises uh, in problem solving, it just ticked every box. And I thought it was just an amazing opportunity for the boys, not just to work with the theory of business and commerce in the classroom, to be able to have challenging real world um, I suppose problems to work with and, and try and problem solve. So it, it just, as I said, ticks all the boxes in what the school as a as a body wants to do in the future in, in terms of enhancing the boys' learning. And so these boys here are will will be up to the challenge, I know, and I'm I'll be watching very very very, very carefully what happens over the coming couple of weeks, um, eight, weeks. eight weeks in terms of the the, the progress ahead. Some of your perhaps issues real world issues that you have with your businesses and again thank you so so much on behalf of the whole school I really do understand the time and the commitment you've given to our school and I really do appreciate that and, and I'm sure we'll give these chaps that will bear, bear wonderful fruit in the future so thank you very very much and I'll hand it over to Greg for the introduction thank you thank you very much good afternoon hi gentlemen very good to be here this program is called Enterprise in the Community. Uh, that's the term given to it by New South Wales Education. And the person uh, from uh, that agency who's sort of sponsoring this, in a sense, Peter O'Dowd, he is meant to be here. He is here. He snuck in the side door. Thank you. Good to see you, Peter. I wanted to give you a shout out, and you, I couldn't think you were here. <laughs> So, uh, yes, yeah, so it's a collaboration really. New South Wales Education, Seven Mile Bench Lab, uh, together with high schools and, of course, local business owners. And I echo Paul's thanks to all our business owners participating. We appreciate that very much. Next one, please, Andrew. So, I just wanted to start off, and I'll give you a quote, and I wonder how many people are familiar with someone who was actually in the education world, very, very famous, a gentleman, gentleman by the name of Sir Ken Robinson. Who's familiar with Sir Ken Robinson? One hand. Oh, there's a few more. Okay. Well, look, here's a, here's a thought. And, and Sir Ken is a most amazing person. Unfortunately or sadly, he passed away last year. I think it was about August. Uh, not particularly old, only about 70, I think. He's famous for many reasons, but he gave a TED talk in 2006, a title, Are Schools Killing Creativity? I think that was the, the correct title. That talk is by far and away the most watched TED talk ever, with well over 70 million views. And it's about a 20 minute talk, and I really honestly would say for everyone here, if you haven't watched that Sir Ken Robinson TED Talk, Google it, Sir Ken Robinson, uh, Creativity TED, you'll find it. Uh, take about 20 minutes and just, just listen to what he says about creativity and young people in particular. But the quote I want to talk to you about was education and training are the keys to a fulfilling future. Turn the key one way and you lock up resources. Turn it the other way and you unlock your resourcefulness. And I kind of like to think that this program that we're participating in with you is the program to unlock the key to your resourcefulness. And we'll come back to that a little bit later. Thanks, Andrew. So the program that we're doing with you over the next eight weeks focuses on three really essential life skills. It's three of nine, but I'm gonna focus on the three that we're working on together. And the skills are entrepreneurial, analytical, and creative. 
And together we call that theme consciously innovating. And let me just give you a quick uh, exemplar of entrepreneurial. The reason we are all sitting here this afternoon is because here with us today are three very entrepreneurial people. And it started off with Peter O'Doherty having some very innovative and entrepreneurial thoughts about how we'd like to create a program for 15 and 16 year old year 9 and 10 students. And Peter and I met a little over a year ago and started talking about his objectives and how we might work up a program to deliver those objectives. That's entrepreneurial. <clears throat> well, we worked together and we created the program. We delivered a pilot last year at St. Paul's uh, Catholic College, just up on the hill. It was very successful and it ran across term three and four, finished November 18th. And I found myself in, it was about mid-December, I was at the Freshwater Campus. Uh, doing something, uh, being a judge at uh, a program there. Morning tea, I start talking to a chap named Andrew McGuire, your teacher from Valley Boys, right? And we were having a, a really great discussion. I said, oh, you know, Andrew, you might be interested in this thing we just did at uh, St. Paul's. And I gave him the background and the story. He very politely listened, which is great. And at the end of it, he said something like, You'll correct me, Andrew, if I get this wrong. <laughs> we need to do that at Valley Boys. When I go back, I'm going to talk to my principal and see if he'd like to have a discussion with you. Andrew did exactly what he said he'd do. Entrepreneurial. Organises a meeting with him and Paul and another colleague. I can't remember sorry, the lady's name. We had a chat, and as Paul just said, he heard the story and said, we need to do this, and we're going to do it. Now, that is a great example of three people sitting in the room today who are being entrepreneurial. And you can see the wonderful things that can happen when you are entrepreneurial. The other skills we'll focus on is to help you understand how to be analytical. The way that works in practice is the business owners are going to give you a problem. You need to work out the background of that problem. Is it actually a problem or is there something more underlying to it? And do the research to confirm exactly what the problem is. That's being analytical. And then creative, kind of links back to Ken Robinson. Because once we understand the problem in detail, there's an opportunity to allow our innate creativity to devise innovative solutions. So that's kind of the story and what we're going to be doing together over the next eight weeks. And I'd say, don't, you don't have to be scared or worried about this program. This is a program where we are collaborating. And I'm very delighted that my fellow directors, Mitch Philby, Rob Forsyth, and Nigel Abbott, are all here and they'll all be working with you directly as your kind of mentors, helping you through this process. We call these skills life skills because they literally are life skills. These are the skills that are gonna help you throughout your life. It's kind of, it's pretty important. Uh, and it's, they're part of a bigger program. And Andrew, maybe just do the next one for me, quickly. So I said, this is part of a, nine life skills. We're focusing down the bottom here, as I said, entrepreneurial, analytical, creative. These other skills we're not going to really touch on particularly, although, you know, throughout this we will do, you'll touch on self-management. And at the end, at the final presentation, the top right, you will be standing here persuading your business owner that you have devised a brilliant solution that they can use in their business. Next one, Andrew, please. And the way this plays out is that the nine skills work into seven themes. So the, the rows and the columns, so that's six, and then that diagonal 
has a, also a theme. So there's seven themes, but the, we're going to focus with you guys on entrepreneurial, analytical, creative. Next one, please. <clears throat> so enterprise in the community is, it's a different experience because it's, experience, it's what's called experiential learning, which commonly means you learn by doing. But it's a little bit more than that because it's also, it's learning by doing, but it's learning through reflection. In other words, you kind of, you're doing it and you're thinking about what you're doing and understanding why you're doing it. And that's exactly the cycle we take you through, through this program. And if you look in these nine boxes here, here we are at the top left with the launch event. We, the next session will be validating that problem, so that's where you're really kind of using your analytical capabilities. And we'll start to think about some different ideas, some fresh ideas that might change the way we think about the problem and will lead into how we design the solution. Then we'll get together with what uh, the presentation structure, the structure that you'll deliver at the end of the uh, program. It's the same for everybody. We don't make you think about that because there kind of isn't time, to be honest. Uh, and it's, it's a seven slide presentation structure. And we start working through that with you and help you start practicing straight away, delivering the content for each of those slides. In that middle block, we get back together again with our business owners. Because what we want to do is not make assumptions that we're on the right track. So it's important that we get together again and give them some feedback about the work you've done, what you've discovered, what you understand, and the sort of ideas you might have toward developing a solution. That meeting could be back here, uh, or it could be at the business owner's offices or business location, and that's some logistics we have to work out. But, <laughs> oh, okay. Uh, but we can work that out. So what in the middle block there, it's important that we get back together with the business owners. And then we're getting into, so we've, we've done our analytical thinking, we've done some ideation, we're starting to think about the presentation structure. We've had a session with the business owners, so we've got a bit of confirmation there that we're kind of on the right track. And then we start working on the solution design. And that could mean all kinds of things. We had a whole range of things happen at St Paul's last year, some of them quite unexpected, but absolutely delightful. So it's really up to us as a group to think about what tools would be used to solve this problem. Does it need technology or is it something else? Then we're going to rehearse the presentation. So what we do literally is we will probably hopefully be here together and the teams, each of the four teams, will actually rehearse their whole seven-slide presentation. What happens there is, it's interesting what happens actually, because it's the first time that each team sees what the other teams are presenting. Uh, and it was kind of fun at St Paul's because some of the teams sort of thought, wow, some of these guys are good, we need to do some more rehearsing and they, they quickly got up to speed and they all did a fantastic presentation at the final event. So that leads into that final presentation where we're kind of back together and we'll try and see if we can get a few VIPs to come. It'd be great if some of the teaching staff can, can be here as well. Uh, and we probably will manage to organise some sort of food, maybe. We'll, we'll think about how we do that. I know food is important. We, we understand food is important. So that's sort of eight. So that's eight weeks, right? So we've got each one of those blocks for those eight weeks. That final one is pathways. And this is kind of an important one for everyone to be aware of because it came about actually in the early discussions that Peter and I had in terms of how would we structure this program. And we talked about it and I said, I think it's really important that there are pathways. That is, we don't get to do all this work, we get to that final presentation, do a fantastic job, and then it all just stops. 
So the pathways concept is that as we work together, there will become apparent some pathways beyond the final presentation where you can continue to work in this, this vein, uh, continue to have uh, skill reinforcement opportunities. You will have had developed a relationship with a business owner. There may be opportunities to do some work with that business owner. You will have got to know Seven Mile Team really well by then and you may have your own ideas that you want to explore and maybe we can help you with those. So there's various ways the pathways can emerge, but we've built that into the program. Next one, please. Where did we get to? Okay. So, as you go through this, this program with this enterprise in the community, you're going to definitely pick up new skills and new knowledge. And one of the things I'd like to mention to you is because, here's why. Because as you go through life, you're going to have lots and lots of ideas. Right? Guaranteed. Now the thing you need with an idea, you don't want to send it out in the world kind of dressed in rags. You don't want your idea to look kind of daggy and drop. And so you need two key things to make your idea look presentable and to give people an opportunity to remember what that idea was about. You need a symbol. Now, you, you might say, well, that looks like a logo and it's kind of, you know, it's the same thing. Symbol, logo, whatever. You need something, some kind of graphic thing that people can remember. Star Time has a very beautiful gold star. That's a symbol. Uh, so when you have your ideas and you think, oh, I kind of like this idea, I want to share it with people, think about defining a symbol for it. And then you need a slogan. Uh, in the startup world, it might be called a tagline or you know, something like that. But basically, you need a symbol, you need a slogan. The slogan we use for our life skills is nine essential keys to help realise your innate potential. That's our slogan. The slogans can change, of course. They do change. But you need to think about a symbol and a slogan to give your great idea some form and substance. You may even do that as part of this program because you basically you'll be presenting an idea to the business owners in the final presentation. You actually might like to create a symbol and a slogan for your idea. Next one, please. Okay. We've got to the point where I can stop talking and that was, uh, this is the last slide. We now have an opportunity for our business owners to spend a few minutes just sharing with you what their business is about and importantly, what the problem is that they want to solve. And when Joe is finished, our fourth business owner has finished speaking, we're going to break up into groups and Mitch is the most fantastic wrangler, so he'll kind of wrangle you into where you need to be. And uh, we will sit with the business owners and we'll help you dig a bit deeper and ask some good questions to validate the information about this problem. All right, have I covered everything? Good, that's great, we've got a tick. Robbie, you're first up. Hi everyone, I'm Robbie, I'm a physiotherapist, I own Seaforth Physio and just locally down the road. Uh, we started our business because we were passionate about physio and wanted to create an environment we wanted to work in and offer an exceptional service. Our practice has grown from a one person practice to now eight physios, an exercise physiologist, a massage therapist and a group of seven admin staff. Um, we are movement specialists, we deal with injuries, acute, chronic, right through to the exercise phase. Sam, our exercise physiologist, is here with us. He's going to be involved in the groups. And um, we have had great joy in providing service to our community, including some of the local teams. Um, we very much enjoy what we're doing, but what we're finding now is we're looking at our um, inquiry rates. 
our repeat attendance, our uh, word of mouth, etc., referrals are very high, but our inquiry levels are a little bit on the low side. So what I want to put out to you is how can we increase our inquiry levels and then hence contact, i.e. number of people coming into our practice for our services. Good luck with that. Thank you. Thank you very much. Hi guys, how are we? Um, my name's Harry McGuire, for those of you following along, brother to that gentleman over there. Here to talk to you about rubbish. Anybody know why today is a good day to talk about rubbish? Can you take this? It's Earth Day today. It's actually Earth Day. It's kind of poetic. It's a perfect day where we get to come in to you guys and actually talk about making real environmental impact. And Rethinking Recycling is a project that we run as part of Wikimedia.org, which is a not-for-profit, and to do exactly that. And so, when we think about rubbish, I always like to start with this question, which is, who do you think in the world is the worst countries for ocean pollution of plastic? So who puts the most plastic into the ocean? Very good. Exactly. Indonesia is actually number two. Who's number one? USA, good question. Actually 20th, would you believe? USA is really actually quite good. Yeah. China, exactly. China. China's number one. It's funny you brought up Indonesia first, because that's the exact country I want to talk to you about. China has 1.4 billion people, huge developing economy. Indonesia has 270 million people, much smaller. And yet it's second. The USA, much bigger population. India, even bigger population again. And yet, way less ocean plastic pollution. The reason, or one of the reasons that Indonesia has such bad pollution rates is that 70% of all waste generated ends up in landfill. 70%. And so all of the things that people are making at home, the hotels, the restaurants are kind of putting out into the world, the plastics, the organics, the residual waste that should go into landfill, all of it going into landfill or actually dumped, which is how the ocean rates get so high. And so the Thinking Recycling is this project that we're running where we're trying to fix that. And our goal is to reduce amount of plastic waste and overall waste that goes into the landfill in Bali specifically by 10% in the next 2024. Which is a pretty tough goal actually. And it's a pretty tough um, ecosystem that we're trying to operate in. Waste management is really complex. And that leads me very nicely I think onto the problem that I have for you guys which is a specific one. The number one reason that we can't run effective ecosystems, recycling ecosystems, is that homes don't, put simply, do the right thing. And what we mean by that is they don't kind of, they generate the rubbish to begin with, reuse rates are really low, and most importantly for us, the amount of people that are sorting their rubbish effectively is much too low for us to be able to sort that rubbish effectively in the recycling center. And so if we have a bag of rubbish that has really valuable recyclable plastics, Coke cans, whatever, cardboard, paper, all things that we can recycle. But that's in the red bin that goes straight to landfill. Can't do anything about it. And so the challenge that we have for you guys today and over the next eight weeks is what are the initiatives that we can run on the ground in Bali at our one sorting centre that will improve the amount of homes that are sorting rubbish and make the homes that already sort rubbish even better at sorting. And the beauty of this problem as well is that this is not just faced by Bali. Australia, I don't know, well, I only recently learned this in the last couple of months. Re Australia recycles 55% of all of the recyclables it collects, kind of on the, on the, on the, on the national average. So basically 45% of all of the plastics, all of the paper that we generate and we put into the yellow bins very disciplinedly, actually never recycled. And so what we're hoping here is that a lot of the solutions we come up with for Bali will also work in our own communities, here, Algala, in Sydney, hopefully Australia. And that as part of this program, I can come up with a bunch of cool ideas that we can run in Bali and we can come and kind of iterate and test. But also that you guys can do some really impactful and positive change in your own lives and your own communities and give it a Cool. That's me. Any questions? 
forward to getting started. Um, we have two local businesses. My name is Natalia. Um, we've got predominantly food businesses. So one is a catering company, which we've had for 15 years. And then for the last five years, we've had a ready-made meals business. So we supply meals to food chains like Harris Farm, QE Food Stores, IGAs, um, not the big retail supermarkets. Um, my husband's been a chef for his whole career and um, we made the decision when we had children to become self-employed to stop having to work nights and weekends all the time and be away from the kids. Um, I've got a diploma in business accounting so that worked quite well for us to start a business together. Um, five years ago we've been, we started with the idea of creating a ready-made meals business. Um, obviously, most people living in Sydney, or most people probably living in Australia are quite time poor. They've got uh, big financial commitments and tend to work quite long hours. Um, so we made the decision to try and move into more of ready-made meals, food production, as opposed to doing catering on weekends, which takes time away from our children. Um, obviously, last year was COVID, and the government brought in restrictions to stop any events. So that basically put an end to our catering business. Um, within two days, every event we had booked last year cancelled, which was weddings, parties, whatever else. Um, obviously, that's panic stations for us because we can't support, pay our mortgage, rent, kids, whatever else we've got to pay. So we had to do something quickly. We were fortunate, though, that we'd been working on this ready-made meals project for five years. We had licenses set up, packaging set up. We had a packaging machine. Um, and we already had contracts set up in New South Wales, Queensland and the ACT. Um, so, ready-made meals is different in food production. Catering is one business model with certain percentages for profit and ready-made meals is different. So to, just to give you an idea, if you were to go into a local IGA shop and buy a $10 ready meal, um, $3.50 of that goes to the retailer to put it on their shelf. They've got to pay their staff rent, electricity, whatever else. A dollar goes to the government in GST. Um, $3.50 of that we spend for our business just on our staff, rent, wages, all the overheads, licenses, packaging, etc. And about a dollar fifty of that is our profit. Um, and about two dollars is the food cost. So out of all of that, um, we want you guys to try and work out how we can possibly make the business model more profitable, um, potentially by trying to maybe sell directly to the customer as opposed to the retailer getting $3.50 of our cut. So that's our proposition for you today. I look after sales and marketing at start time and I'm clearly letting down the team. I haven't put my shirt on. <laughs> so you can see we try and dominate the, the green um, as our brand and the star shines through. I'm going to talk about the problem but this is going to set up um, a talk to you about where we come from and why we do what we do. Thank you, Joe. Hi, boys. Um, uh, it was interesting that, that Greg, well, prophetic that Greg started with a quote from Ken Robinson because in 2007, we started the business in 2006, a friend of ours showed us this Ken Robinson talk, TED talk, and we said, wow, that articulates what we're trying to do. And the essence of what um, uh, that talk was about was. It was titled, Do Schools Kill Creativity? Um, but essentially his argument was that there's this hierarchy of subjects in schools that there's the maths, English, sciences, but the creative, performing uh, arts come way right down the bottom. And, and he argued that they're just as important as each other for the development of, um, of the child. And um, well, it's also interesting that Parsi Salzberg, who's um, big education advocate in this, in this country um, from Finland who was a very good friend of Ken Robinson. We just uh, helped him produce a video for the commemoration of Ken Robinson's um, passing. And in that video he, he states that school should be a place where kids um, discover what they want to do, discover what they're passionate about. And, um, and I think this program is 
directly towards that 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 goal. This sort of exercise is where you guys get to experience. Wow, I never knew this existed. I never knew this could be so cool. And I'm passionate about this, and it can guide you in that direction. So. I've diverted a bit, but um, it's kind of, um, it's really in line with what we do. And we started off um, with a mission to help kids shine through the performing of creative arts. Uh, so we provide uh, kids, teachers, organisations and schools uh, with world-class uh, creative arts programs. And that could be from filmmaking to robotics, magic to performing arts and everything in between. Um, uh, we've we've uh, inspired, we like to say we've inspired over 45,000 kids. So we provide um, incursions in filmmaking to schools. We uh, teach teachers uh, in professional development workshops how to use filmmaking as a curriculum vehicle. Uh, we do holiday programs um, in all sorts of ranges of, of, of performing and creative arts. Uh, and we also do them after school. Uh, I think that's, we do quite a lot of things. Um, but it's, at the core of it, it's, all, it's always about uh, this framework of creativity and giving uh, kids a chance to express themselves through creating something that didn't exist before they came together and, and did it. So whether that's making a film, whether that's uh, whether that's doing a, uh, an animation film or, um, or learning a magic trick. Um, the creative process is inherent through that where kids get to collaborate, they get to uh, commit, um, they have to have courage to see that through and to, and to go outside their comfort zone. Um, and also, very importantly, one of our values in all of our programs is compassion. Um, being uh, in a group, you've got to be compassionate about yourself in that, but also each other um, and how you, uh, how you communicate, how you articulate and get through a project together. So um, I think that's pretty much what we do. Um, we now, uh, we do workshops all over Australia. We actually did a workshop in Indonesia um, a few years ago now and that was a, that was a great experience. Um, we work with a lot of non-for-profits, underprivileged children as well, um, and yeah, we, we love what we do, and we're really excited to be a part of this program and, and work as a team with you guys. We see you guys as a really important asset, actually, in helping us solve, solve this problem. Okay, so um, for quite a number of years we've been wanting to move our programs online, and it was not until COVID hit that we, we, we really gave, that gave us the push to do that. So in the last six months, we've um, developed a, a, a learning platform online of, with all our creativity programs. And one of the challenges is we have now that we're taking this further, which is to, de to develop a platform to match that. Um, we use Zoom through that time, and now we've realised that Zoom isn't really um, the most engaging platform for kids to learn and be interactive with. So we're going to create the platform to match the content that we deliver. The problem we have is a marketing problem, which is how do we market to children when we're not allowed to? Our means of marketing is through parents, and to date all our online kids have been, have heard about Startime through their parents talking about, you know, do you want to do this online program with Startime? Or through organisations that are promoting our services. So we'd like to look at perhaps putting on a, some sort of marketing stunt, something that creates a lot of hype around what we're doing, where kids can um, interact, experience something, um, get them so excited and engaged with what we're doing that they actually want to put themselves on a pre-launch wait list before we launch our platform. Um, we don't want to feed you with too many ideas, we want to really for you to bring your creati own creativity to the, to the mix and see what you come up with. And I think given you're all young and got great minds, that will probably be in awe of what you come up with. Um, there will be some parameters around that which we can go, go into a bit later. But ultimately, our, our main purpose for doing what we do is to celebrate the child's uniqueness. It's to it's to, um, sorry, to harness, to harness that and
and to allow them to dream big wherever they live and with whatever challenges they may face. So that's at the root of what we do. Can I just finish on I'd just like to finish on one thing. Uh, but but this, is a, this is a creative process that Greg's already alluded to that you guys are going through. And what's really important at the ideation stage is that you throw everything on the table, like don't be afraid. However dumb you might think the idea is, put it out there, throw it out there for discussion. That's the only thing I have to add. Now, in the moment I'm going to introduce Peter O'Doherty, but I just want to say two things to you. Uh, I meant to say before that I want to give you a promise in relation to your participation in this program. I am absolutely confident that if you put yourself in, put your effort in, that you will get tremendous value from being in the program. That's my promise to you. Now, if I don't fulfill that promise at the end of that final presentation, I want you to come and tell me why. Okay? And don't be afraid to tell me if you think I haven't fulfilled my promise. So that's my promise to you. There's one other thing that I think is worth just mentioning. And it comes from a quote from a guy, do you know a guy named Jeff Bezos? Have you heard of Jeff Bezos? He's the guy who started Amazon, right? He's kind of, he is kind of famous. I think everyone pretty much knows Jeff Bezos. And I think it's for the last 23 years, he has written a letter to his shareholders and he just recently wrote the latest newsletter as CEO of Amazon. He's advising now that he's stepping down from the CEO role, which is kind of a big deal, probably a big deal if you're an Amazon shareholder. But there's a wonderful quote that was in his letter that I'll just read to you. And this is Jeff Bezos' words. We all know that distinctiveness, originality, is valuable. We are all taught to be yourself. What I'm really asking you to do is to embrace and be realistic about how much energy it takes to maintain that distinctiveness. The world wants you to be typical. In a thousand ways it pulls at you. Don't let it happen. That's the Jeff Bezos quote. And really to distill it down, what he's kind of saying is, you need, or all of you need to find ways as you move through life to be a little bit unique and distinctive. Because what you want to do is you want to stand out from the great mass of students that are your age, going through school, going through college, going into work, going into business. So I think it's great advice from Jeff Bezos and something that you probably could just think a little bit about as you go through the program. And now, Peter O'Doherty. Peter, thank you for being the sponsor of this program. And it's great to have you with us today. Um, I'm not, I'm not going to talk too long because those pizzas smell very nice. Um, as I said, my name is Peter O'Doherty. I work with the Department of Education. Um, the idea behind the program is to bring industry into the classroom. Um, what Greg and Mitch have done, very exciting. We did a really good pilot down in Manly last year and, and looking really to get the, really push the program on this year. So firstly, thank you Greg and Mitch for the, for the great work and, and I know like, I've got full trust in them. Secondly, thank you so much for the businesses. Um, I know that um, running your own business, is, 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 there's, a lot, a, there's a big pressure on that. So really appreciate your time coming in and, and, and spending time with your local local students and local community. And finally, I'd, I'd just like to thank the school and also the students um, for taking part in this program. Um, I think the one thing, um, just to, coming back to what you mentioned before, is, is, is don't be afraid to ask a question. Uh, if you don't understand something, if you, if you want to find out about something, just ask a question. Uh, because the big thing about this program, this is in school, um, we don't want it to be like a, like a, like a, a classroom setting. So you guys are equal with all these people in this room. Uh, so just keep that in mind over the course of the program. And also uh, at the end of it, we really want you to let us know if you like it, if you don't like it, uh, what you liked about it, what do you think we could do better as well. Um, it's really important to do that, okay? Thanks very much. Thank you, Peter.